it's good. Cool. Right, good. let's go. We can start. I'm gonna go Great. Thank you, Bradley again. <laughs> um, so, how are you? Everything's going well over there in the UK? Yeah, uh, it is. I'm back at work. Um, I've been working, uh, obviously, every weekday and and been... Well, we've just moved into a house. So this house you can see on the video here, it's all very bright and white and it's because it's brand new, uh, new for us and also just built. So it's been a very hectic couple of weeks um, moving in, starting back at work and obviously still under partial lockdown. Yeah, that's, that's been, I'm pretty sure that's been a good entertainment for the lockdown yeah, in the last weeks. <laughs> it would have been better if it happened at the beginning, so we could have un unpacked all the boxes, but I'm glad we're, glad we're into a new house. Good, well done. So um, I've been reading about you in different sources, and you started in karting at the age of 10 in 1995, and apologies for this. I'm gonna show just a picture that you are actually sharing in your um, in your personal website. That's uh, you can leave the link uh, later. So let me just uh, get that uh, here. There you go. So this is a picture of probably Philbot. Let me know if you can see it. Um, I can see and, it. I can see it just fine. I, and you don't have to apologize. I'm quite happy for you to show. Picture of me <laughs> looking young. We accept any comments from many viewers uh, on <laughs> on the way Bradley looks like. <laughs> but you were 10. Uh, this is a 1995 picture. You were 10. This is the first time you took part in the Formula TKM. Is that right? This is actually cadets. So, um, cadets. so I, when I was 10, you're kind of halfway into your cadet um, career. You get a few years. It's basically eight till twelve is a window. It certainly was when I was young. So that's that's when that's the ages you can drive these carts. And this was a lovely brand new ARC cart. This is before it was ever raced. I can see how clean and um, fresh yeah. it was there, and how the stickers are all nice. Uh, and me and my my little brother Paul both had this exact same go kart. And um, this came after after probably a year and a half or so of racing indoor carts down on the south coast in a place called Fairham, a track which no longer exists, but there are some nearby. And this, this photograph, I remember when this was taken, this was taken in a car park near my house. And um, I drove some, some go-karts from that car park onto the road when I was a bit older than that, um, which <laughs> hopefully I can't get into trouble for talking about that now, but yeah, that was- um, It's been more than 20 years, so yeah, it has. don't worry about it. So, um, you moved to Formula TKM when you were 12 then. So you said you used that car between 8 and 12, and then when you were 12, when you turned 12, you moved to Formula TKM. Kind of. Uh, it's not quite as simple as that, because I tested a TKM when I turned 12, um, but I actually had a crash. It was at Clay Pigeon um, down on the south coast again. I'd never driven the track before, and as I, as I left the pits, I, bas I think it might have been a stuck throttle. It was either a stuck throttle or it was me not braking early enough. But whatever happened, I crashed at the first corner out of the pits. Um, and that was the that was the only time I drove a TKM cart until I was 17, or maybe 18, actually. So I had a big break between 12 and 18, where all I did was uh -huh. occasional indoor karting. We basically ran out of money to, to progress and buy new carts, especially if I was going to just crash at the first corner. I think that was the logic. So, uh, uh, okay. Well, uh, so then you joined the TKM when you were 17 or 18, and yeah. you raced there for how long did you race doing that? So, that yeah, I think I raced maybe for two years uh, with my own TKM. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of different ones. I, I bought, uh, basically, I took out a loan when because I got a normal job. I was working in office, so that meant yep. I could then get a loan. It was back before the, the credit crunch and all that kind of thing, so they were kind of giving out credit cards and loans to people very easily. And I really wanted to go racing again. So I bought this cheap, rubbish go-kart, probably from eBay. Um, I had no idea what I was looking at, really. I got something that was pretty bad. Um, so bad, in fact, that when, when I took it to a race, it was illegal. They wouldn't let it race. It needed updating quite significantly. And that's, oh. that's aside from the fact it was probably very slow because the engine had probably never been rebuilt. But then I, mm. I kind of I bought another one after that. And we had a rubbish old trailer. And me and my friend, um, I had a friend called Paul Jordan. And... And we kind of egged each other on to buy these carts and get back into racing. And, and I just ran myself from a trailer for probably two, two and a half years. Um, 
I actually restarted a, there was a, a cart club at a place called Matcham's, which mm-hmm. had it kind of gone defunct. It, it stopped running. And I basically, because I wanted somewhere nearby to race, I organized a championship um, for people with TKM carts and Rotaxes and that kind of thing. And I ended up racing in that initially. Uh, but the car, oh. the track wasn't very good for the carts because it was so bumpy with tree roots. You might have even been to Matcham's yourself for um, for a, a rental cart session. It no longer exists, yeah. but it did. Mm. Okay, so um, that's an, that's an interesting, uh, slightly even different version than what I understood from other sources. Uh, but in any case, the Formula TKM, uh, that's that became like in one of the most important karting categories in the beginning of the 90s in the UK. So Badon, Hamilton, and I guess other good drivers were racing there. So do you remember any, uh, the, the driver you had the most fights with during that um, field of karting? I, yeah, probably one. Because I, because I was doing TKM, quite a lot older than any of the top guys would have been doing it. You know, they, they would have moved on from that when they were probably 15. Whereas I, I was just getting back into driving my yeah. own car when I was kind of 18. So, I, you know, if I had any money, I would have been in, in cars at that point. So I didn't race against any of those names that you'd know. Um, but probably the one person I remember uh, would be George Lovell. Um, because I raced him at Matchams a lot. And he wasn't normally even in a TKM. We, we were in a bit of a mixed class where he was in a Rotax, I was in a TKM. They, they put the classes in together to try and boost the numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, the race I can remember the most, the, you know, the closest, the best battle, like the, the, the most awesome race I had in that TKM was, was against George. Um, I can't remember who won. One of us won, but I can't remember <laughs> who won. Um, but yeah, okay. that was, he was the, probably the best person I raced against. Well, so it'll be very interesting to see uh, how he progressed in his racing career and how you compare now uh, in which category you are you are racing at the moment and how much you progressed uh, over these years after car. Yeah, George moved on to Formula Ford, I think, and he I think he won the British Formula Ford Winter Championship, um, uh-huh. and he would probably have been doing that a long time before I then started car racing a, a couple of years later, but. Um, and now George runs the South Coast karting track um, down in Bournemouth. Um, so he's not he's not racing uh, anymore, uh, okay. um, except you know for fun. Yeah, of course. So um, you moved uh, to like let's say a real racing car for the first time. Um, according to what I've seen, 2007 with the Toyota MR2 Motor Club Challenge. All right. Yeah, yeah. So I I went and got a job at, um, at Bedford Autodrome. So that, that happened first. I, I actually did a couple of these scholarship things before I started racing. So, uh-huh. I, you know, you pay, I think it was something like 500 pounds. It might have been less um, back then in around 2004, 2005. And I, I progressed through the different stages. You drove like an old Formula Ford and had to do some interviews and things. And the guy who won was a driver called Jamie Stanley. And he worked at Bedford Autodrome for Jonathan Palmer uh, at the Palmer Sport um, event. And he, he basically got me a job there or he, he at least told me I should apply for a job um, yeah. and, and I did. And then I ended up moving up here to Bedford. I'm, I'm in Bedworth, just outside of Bedford now. And I've been here since 2005 because of, because of working there. And having worked for maybe a year and a half at Bedford Autodrome as a race instructor with only go-kart experience. So I was teaching people how to drive race cars, but I'd never raced a race car. I, my only experience was karting and driving the school cars that, that, that we were teaching people in. Yeah. That's, that's when I then... Um, managed to scrape together enough money to do the first season in, in the Toyota mr that you mentioned. But that was an, an impressive uh, lead to the a real racing car, because even, even if you hadn't raced any real car before, the first year, championship victory with three wins, seven podiums, the first year. How do you do that? <laughs> um, it, was, it, it, sounds, um, it sounds silly, but it was easier. Um, and it was easier because... I'd been instructing in much faster cars. So when, you're, when your job is to sit in a car which has, say, you know, 300 or 400 horsepower and downforce and big sticky tires and you're traveling really fast through the corners, when you then race at the weekend a car with only maybe 130 horsepower and road tires and no downforce, it all seems mm-hmm. pretty slow. So the most difficult thing about that year in the Toyota MR2s was that we had a very old engine 
So the, the engine in the car had done 140,000 miles. It was the original engine that the car had as a road car. It had never been rebuilt. Wow. And the car was pretty, it looks really nice, but it was pretty worn out. Um, so we painted <laughs> it. Um, my, granddad, my granddad had it painted for me in some beautiful colors. It looked really good, but yeah, it wasn't very fast. So I was, um, I was struggling to keep up with people who had done the normal things, which most people would do if you were running this kind of car every year, which is get the engine yep. rebuilt and get it tuned within the rate. You know, it's obviously you're not making it more powerful than you're allowed, but you make it as good as new. And we definitely didn't do that. So that was the trickiest thing. Well, Driving the car wasn't so hard, but yeah, straight line speed was hard. Well, anyway, uh, the numbers look very good. And um, might be a rationale behind that, but yeah, the num those numbers for at least for the first year for any uh, rookie in that category are just amazing. But then the next big step in the in real racing cars for me on what I've seen was in two, 2013. Uh, 2013 for me was um, for what I've seen in your background the the biggest step in your career. That was the year when you had a, a big leap into the real racing cars. Uh, and that's basically boosted the rest of your confidence and racing career. So first in the Volkswagen Fan Cup Great Britain, that earned you a seat in the VL, VLN series, which is the Endurance Racing Championship in Norway with the Peugeot 208 GTI, GTI racing experience. You won in the debut. So do you agree that this was definitely the, um, the biggest push in your racing career? How do, you, how, do you, how do you feel during this year? Yeah, so 2013 was a really crazy, crazy time because I, I hadn't raced a car since the first year. So 2007 was, was the MR2s, like we mentioned, and then I did nothing, like no racing at all apart from obviously some occasional rental karting yeah. um, and, and then you know instructing every day. I did no competitive racing until 2013 and I wasn't expecting to do any then either. That really came mm -hmm. out of the blue. I was at my um, at a house we were renting with my fiance Becca at, in a place called Crowton, um, which is near Brackley. And I was on Facebook on my phone probably and I saw a Facebook competition run by Peugeot and they mm -hmm. were looking for people with international racing licenses to, to enter the first round of this thing called the 208 GTI racing experience, which was essentially a marketing effort to sell the upcoming new Peugeot 208 GTI. So they were doing this as a, as a marketing exercise to boost the sales and, and, the, um, and the awareness of the 208 GTI. So uh -huh. I, clicked, I clicked on the link and I said, yes, I want to enter. And it said you must have, it gave a lot of criteria, but the main one was that you had to be eligible for an international C racing license. And the tricky thing about that is you have to have done a, a certain number of UK races within the last few years to then qualify you to apply for an international C. So the first hurdle was I didn't really um, qualify for an international, I certainly never had an international race license, but I spoke to the MSA and I thought they would say no, but they said, yes, you basically have the bare minimum results, um, which mean you can then pay us and apply for an international C license. So just, got, one, just one comment, just um, for maybe some viewers don't know, the MSA is a motorsport um, yes. organization in the UK. It's like the FIA internationally, but only in the UK. Yeah, exactly. It's now called Motorsport UK, uh, which is a bit of a less confusing yeah. name. but. Uh, yeah, so essentially I got them to email me the proof that I was eligible to enter. I then, mm -hmm. it, but at that point I still thought, well, you know, I'm going to be up against hundreds of other drivers, so this is still a very slim chance. But I entered the first um, round, which was essentially, a, you had to do a one lap shootout. Um, all the drivers came throughout the day and it ended up as just over 400 UK race drivers, uh, British touring car drivers, GT drivers, you know, any, any everyone who had an international C license, wanted to win this drive with Peugeot because it's a very rare opportunity to just get a factory drive with a manufacturer from nowhere. So you had to do one lap in a Peugeot 208 road car, not a GTI, just a 1.2 litre 208 Allure, I think it's called, which is like a shopping car. And yeah. you had one lap and it was all electronically timed. They had cones that if you touch the cone, your lap was disqualified. And if you cut a corner, it was, it was obvious. And nobody knew what lap time they did. You went out, out lap, flying lap, back to the pits, and then goodbye, we'll, we'll let you know how you did. And then 
three or four days later, maybe maybe a week, um, my friend Pat Buss, who um, who kind of features in my life a bit later on, which I'll, I'll talk about later, he, I think he called me. I think it was a telephone call whilst I was at our house in Crowden. And he said, have you seen the results? And I, I hadn't. And they'd been posted online somewhere, I think on, on the Peugeot website. And he mm. said, you probably want to have a look now. So I looked at the results and I'd actually come second in this first round. So out of the 400 drivers, I was second. And I was about two tenths of a second off of the top driver. The top driver was someone called Nigel Moore, who was, I believe, Formula Palmer Audi champion, Janetta champion. He was a factory Janetta driver, Le Mans wow. driver. And in third place was David Pittard, who is now a works BMW driver in the VLN series. Um, and, uh, and there were a couple of other drivers as well. So the top five of us then progressed through to the international final at, um, at a place called La Ferte Gaucher in France, which was a track I'd never been to and never heard of. Um, but the idea was then that you would have to compete against the other four drivers from your home country. So there were various other countries involved and they all had to, the drivers had to compete against their own compatriots. And so a few weeks later, I was off to La Ferte Gaucher in France to do this international final. Before that, just because I like to be prepared, um, my granddad and I took a trip in my Skoda City Go that I had back then and we drove <laughs> over to the track. Um, and there was nothing in the rules that said you couldn't visit the circuit. And I figured it would be a good idea to go and see the track before we turn up on the day. So I went there. There was nothing you could do. You couldn't take your own car on track. But the one thing you could do was pay something like 100 euros to do two laps in a Ferrari around this track. So I paid the money. I went in with an instructor, even though I was an instructor at the time. It was my job, too. And I said, I'm really sorry, man. I don't need to go fast. I just want to drive around the track. And it was probably the easiest drive that guy had all day. I just drove around a couple of laps. And although I wouldn't say I was an expert, I at least knew roughly where things were ready for the international final about a week later. Um, so then we went to that. We had a series of shootouts, very similar to the first one, where it was all about the fastest lap in each car, different tracks. And throughout the day, every couple of hours, Peugeot got rid of the slowest driver. So you ended up with the final two, who would get to drive the the Peugeot 208 GTI road car, which was really like the only one in, in the world at that point, or the only one they were letting any, anyone drive. So we yeah. had to be careful yeah. with it. And then you had a, a um, an interview with the, the team boss and, and some former Le Mans winners for Peugeot. And and so it was me and David Pittard, the final two, and we went through, we did this lap in the, the GTI. I thought I'd screwed it up because I... I missed a gear. It was a left-hand drive car. So I, I think I went down to first when I didn't mean to. But, and then we had the interview and I, I did a little French speech, which is on, on YouTube somewhere. Um, and eventually they announced it and I got the drive. So, so that's how that all began. So yeah, that's a long, a long story to get to that point. But that really, as you said, is where it suddenly kicked up a gear and, and things I was suddenly doing from nothing, doing no racing since 2007. I was suddenly on this program with Peugeot to prepare for the Nürburgring 24 hours. And, and to cut that story as short as possible, we did a couple of VLN races in a slower Peugeot to get our license for, for the 24 hours. You have to have a, a Nürburgring Nordschleife gold permit in order to compete in, in the category we were in, in in 24 hours. And then um, we got those. I won that first race. We had a, a couple of other races. I think we came second or third in the class. And then at the 24 hours itself, we came third. Uh, the team actually came first, second and third, but I was in the rookie team. Um, I was the, the three or four least experienced drivers were all put in together and so we, mm -hmm. we came third but the car was in one piece and I actually won this trophy that's here on the shelf this is my favourite oh. trophy this this little glass thing here so Nürburgring 24 hour trophies are always beautiful blown gra glass and that's what that is so so yeah that, that was yeah. my beginning of my relationship with Peugeot and that that's what then you mentioned about the Fun Cup the Volkswagen Fun Cup I, I did one race in that as like an invitation and that was again off the back of this Peugeot um, racing I was just called someone uh, a chap called Eugene O'Brien called me to, to come mm. and race in that and, and that went really well as well wow that's a very interesting story um, I got you were overwhelmed uh, from May today to become a special driver um, and obviously jumping from racing cars for a few years and then performing that well in, in a real car that's, that's amazing and that brought you also to one of your most famous pictures, photos, moments in, in your racing career. Maybe not the best, or maybe it is, but at least the most um, prestigious photo, which is this one I'm going to show just in a second. 
So in 2015, you had the great opportunity to race against um, Sebastian Vettel. So let me just take this. Uh, you can see it now, I guess. Yeah, I need to so find. This is a I need to find where the real photo of this is because it's here somewhere. It's wrapped up probably because we just moved house. So I need to find this. Ah, uh, okay. So well, this is in your website anyway. But this is in 2015, Race of Champions. Uh, you beat Sebastian Vettel, apart from other drivers, of course. How did it feel uh, to compete against him uh, and other drivers in such a massive event like the Race of Champions? So yeah, this was another really unexpected event. Um, this was another online competition. So uh, this seems to be where all, all the cool things I've, I've been able to do over the years have been from just a speculative click on Facebook or, or another website running a competition. And this was no different. So these guys um, wanted a, a wild card driver to come and take one of the spots at, at the 2015 Race of Champions in London. And uh, basically mm -hmm. what you had to do was make a video montage of your best motorsport moments and then you had to try and get the public to vote on it and the, basically the driver with the most votes or the top two drivers with the most votes would go through to a shootout a similar kind of story again um and then the fastest driver would win the place so uh, it was one of the most stressful weeks or a couple of weeks of my life because it was a constant checking on facebook and to, to just to see if we'd got the most votes and it got very close at times a couple of the other drivers um, were really close to beating me on votes, but I managed to share the, the share the hell out of it and get it to basically every forum and, and website I possibly could and get enough votes. And me and a chap called Des Foley um, got through to the final and we did like a, an aerial atom shootout at, at the stadium the day before yeah. the race of champions. And I was lucky enough to, to win that and then get the place. And it, and it then became even bigger because um, Jorge Lorenzo, MotoGP rider, had injured himself, I think at a party maybe. I think he had hurt his ankle dancing or something at a party. And that <laughs> meant I also, not only did I get to compete in this um, skills challenge, which was what it was supposed to be originally, but I also got to compete in the main race of champions as well, which was really cool. Um, the element that I beat Sebastian at was the skills challenge. That was where we basically, the video again is on my, on my YouTube channel. Um, we basically had to to do a lap of a little course, a little auto test course, um, do donuts and drifting and handbrake turns and all this kind of thing in the centre of the stadium in an aerial atom. Um, and and yes, yeah, so that's that's where that fo uh, photo is from. And I got to do that a few times because there were a couple of different competitions. There was like a celebrity one, and then there was a pro skills challenge against all the you know the F1 drivers and the rally drivers and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I managed to. I actually I didn't win the pro skills challenge. I think I was second. It was either second or third. I was about half a tenth of a second off of Petter Solberg. But I definitely I beat all the Formula One drivers, including Sebastian. And, and Sebastian was also in the Celebrity Skills Challenge. And that's where that photo is from. And that's where this trophy here is from. That's this one over here. Oh, so you've chosen that's a massive some, trophy. You've chosen some good, um, good photos to use. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's probably my, my next most prized trophy. Uh -huh. So I've watched that video. It's impressive. Uh, obviously, any audio that's on isn't great to drive. I guess, and I saw the video of you doing the, the skill challenge. It's amazing. Uh, what did Sebastian tell you after after jumping off the car? He didn't say anything to me, to be honest. Um, he he hated you, maybe. He he was <laughs> even before that happened. Um, it he was one of the slightly less friendly drivers. So. There were a lot of guys. We spent a lot of time in the locker room because there wasn't really anywhere else to go um, as one of the drivers. You basically were in this locker room. Each person had their own locker with their name above it. Uh, mine was Jorge Lorenzo, but with my name stuck over the top of it. And, uh, <laughs> and you had, you know, people like Daniel Ricciardo and, and Roman Grosjean and a few different F1 guys and, you know, famous GT and rally drivers. And most people were pretty friendly. Sebastian just didn't really want to talk. I did um, video interviews with people for my Facebook page. And Sebastian was just like, I don't do social media, which is, I guess, that's how he... I didn't realise at the time, but now I know he doesn't ever do any kind of social yeah. media. He's quite a private guy, so... Um, well, but yeah, he never really said anything. I d certainly didn't get a well done or anything like that from him. Uh, maybe he was full of... full with um, anger for having lost the, <laughs> the challenge. Um, in any case, that was a great moment for you. Then, um, after that, 
year, uh, in between 2016 and 2018, you drove different cars. So even you, even though you were still with the official program, you drove um, BMW 4 Fiesta and the Porsche Cayman GT4 uh, in the 20, in several 24-hour races in Nürburgring. So you must know the Nürburgring dump pad, like, uh, like the back of the pen. Like, uh, like you could say, like the like my forearm. I have a I have a picture oh, of wow. my arm as well. So yeah, yeah. So not not just the back of my hand, <laughs> the front of my arm. So you can look at your run whenever you are racing in Norwalk and just to remember which corner comes next. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done a lot of laps there now. Yeah. So um, among all those cars, I'm pretty interested to see, and before talking about the Peugeot 308 GTI that you drive at, at the moment, um, which is the car that you enjoy to drive in the most? And why? That's a really good question. So out of those three Probably the BMW. Now, it's not a good car. The BMW 330 was thrown together last minute. The drivers were thrown in last minute. The whole the whole project was basically just a road car chucked into the Nürburgring 24 hours. It was probably the slowest car in the race. Um, but that was probably the most fun of those three to drive because somehow we were doing it. Somehow we'd managed to cobble together this this program to do the 24 hours with zero budget i don't know how little money i spent basically no money um i met some friends in the uh, one friend in particular phil ben um who turned into a sponsor and a good friend later on i met him in the bar at the hotel next to the next to the track whilst i was trying to get some stickers ready to put onto the car and like cut out these stickers because that's how i'd funded it basically i just got loads and loads of small stickers and lots of people had spent very small amounts of money and we just plastered wow. the car in stickers. And Phil <laughs> then came and helped me. He was really excited to be there. And he came in the pits and helped me stick stickers all over this car. Um, but anyway, it made it to the finish. And it was called The Underdog. The car was nicknamed The Underdog. And it, I'm sure loads of stuff was broken on it. I'm sure it, it hit the wall in the middle of the night with one of my teammates. All sorts of stuff happened. But the car made it to the finish. It came fifth in its class. And um, I think the other reason it was more fun maybe than the others was because it was such a bad car and it was so ropey. It didn't, yeah. it didn't matter as much if something happened to it. Whereas the Cayman, for example, I had a £20,000 damage deposit that I would have to find if I damaged it. And I did not have that money. Um, so that was, a, that was a very stressful time. So although the Cayman GT4 was by far the fastest of those, it was yeah there's a picture of it so, so you can see how much faster that is than an old road car bmw um that was scary because i'd had basically no practice just you know a couple of laps maybe two maybe three laps the day before and then straight into the race and you've got a lot of responsibility to not destroy that car um, financially and my yeah. my good friend luke jones kind of put his own savings up as a deposit for that so i, I had even more pressure not to not to mm. bin it, basically. So yeah, the fastest one was the least enjoyable, but but obviously, you know, really, really fast. That's quite interesting. I didn't expect the answer, uh, but obviously it makes sense. Um, the, the BMW was the cheapest. You can just throw it and drive it uh, and kind of mistreat it. <laughs> so it became the, the most fun. And just the last question in terms of re um, real racing cars. The car that you are driving at the moment, which is a Peugeot 308, you are the champion in 2018 and 2019 of the BLM series. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I remember to have a, a, um, a conversation with you about this car, uh, but tell us how, they, how does it feel to drive and what's the thing you like the most about it? What, and, Tell us about your experience uh, in this team that you are you belong to at Mayan. Right yeah, so this this was uh, another one of those you know really coincidental, very fortunate things to happen. Um, I was on my way to the race in the Porsche. I was I was on my way with Luke, my friend, to to the Nurburgring when my road car, which was a Peugeot two hundred eight GTI, broke down at Calais. And so we were towed to a Peugeot dealership and I, I got on Facebook to ask for help. So if there's anyone who can help us get to the Nürburgring or help us repair the car. 
And a guy called Christian Urban, who is um, one of the managers at Net Auto House, which is a Peugeot dealership near the Nürburgring, he messaged uh-huh. me and said, get it to us and we'll help fix it for you. So we managed to limp the car the four and a half hours or so to the Nürburgring. And we took it to the workshop of the Net Auto House guys. And I was kind of, you know, mentally focused on racing that Porsche that weekend. And Christian mentioned to me in passing, oh, we've got a project for next year with this new 308 racing cup car. Maybe you'd like to drive with us. So we kept in contact. And then I ended up driving for them for three years, 2017, 18 and 19. 2017 was kind of obviously a learning year for me. My teammates were extremely experienced, um, Jürgen and Akim. But for me, it was, you know, first full season racing at the Nürburgring. And we came third that year in the TCR category. And we then switched category to SP2T, which is basically touring cars with um, under two litre engines and a turbo. Okay. And we, that's, that's what we won the last couple of years. And we won every single race in the, in the season last year, which was really cool. I have a, a lot of trophies in the garage that I need to dust off and get on display mm-hmm. at some point um, once we unbox a few more boxes. But really, the, the coolest thing about those three years was being able to race consistently, you know, doing every race there was, which was really a first for me, because up until that point, all the other racing we've mentioned, apart from the MR2s all the way back in 2007, 10 years before, all the other racing was one-offs. You know, we did the Peugeot event in 2013 was the Nürburgring 24 hours. We did two or three races before that, but we didn't do the whole season. It was always in a slightly different car and... You know, it was for a reason. It was to get the license. You weren't really competing in the championship. Whereas 2017, 18 and 19, we were in the season. We had, you know, the race suits were made properly with all the proper sponsors. The car had all the sponsors on for the whole season. And we got to evolve the setup and and make modifications to the car throughout the throughout the three years and make it faster and faster. And um, so that's a picture from 2018. And I can tell that because that's got the old front um, bumper so the car even the car itself evolved um to a you know a slightly more modern shape so yeah that's a that's a 2018 one with, when euro repair became the main sponsor and that is me dri- i can see that's me driving through the window uh, yeah. and yeah. that's that's going into a corner called whipperman on the noise cipher i can see i can see where that is and you use a lot of curb on that corner as you can tell i um, mean it yeah. also really gave me the opportunity to to become a, a bit more of an expert at the noise cipher you know i had Lots of practice sessions, lots of qualifying sessions, lots and lots of long races in all conditions. You know, everything from snow, fog, sunshine, lots of rain, obviously. In 2018, it rained all year until about the eighth race. So, um, wow. yeah. So, uh, but just to sum everything up, the nicest thing was the team. Uh, the Net Motorsport team was just, it's a family team, um, kind of a semi-works Peugeot entry. You know, they had some, some support from Peugeot and a, a good amount of support from Michelin as well. But, um, but really, it was a family team, you know, run by a core of people who also worked at the car dealership. Um, and they were just the nicest guys. And, and I still count them as some of my closest friends. So I'm actually, you said that I'm, I'm racing that at the moment. I'm actually not racing that this year. This year. Obviously, nobody's raced anything so far this year. Yeah. But I'm also not planning to race that car this year. Um, Jürgen and Akin, my teammates, I believe are competing in, in the AM category of the TCR class. Um, so I'm not eligible to race in AM because I'm an FIA silver rated driver. So I wouldn't be able to race with them anyway. But this year I'm actually going to be racing in the UK anyway. So I'm going to be racing a, a Lotus Elise in the Super GT class of uh, of an endurance sports car championship in the UK. So I'm just waiting at the moment to hear when the races start and where we're going. Um, but that's that's it at the moment. Oh, very good. Um, that's not me saying um team or missing story that you are um, going through with Peugeot. I've watched some videos, uh, some of your races, and um, strongly recommend the viewers to go to your channel and have a look at the races because they are very interesting. And many battles in, on the on track. So that doesn't come from any magic. You've had a lot of experience in karting. So we were saying before uh, that you, you started when you were 10, then when you were 12, kind of to change to a TKM. But then a few years later, you had some other big uh, achievements. So first position in the British 24-hour T-side three times in the rental car, 
on yeah, three, three times. Yeah, three different classes, I think, or maybe two. It was certainly the standard slow hire carts. We won in the club hire carts as well. Um, I think that was. I think we've done that twice. I did, my friend Alex Van Jean's team, we won that as well in the club hire. So, yeah, so two different classes, three 24-hour wins, and we came third as well one year in the, in the owner category, in, in the fastest carts. We never wow. quite never quite won the race overall, which was a shame. Okay, so yeah. But anyway, first in your category, which, which is what counts. Um, 2013 Red Bull card fight in the UK. So you uh, were 12th in the in the 12th position overall in the UK, but you won the the let's say the qualifying uh, or the qualifier. Um, Kind of. So, yeah, so in the regional um, qualifying races, that's where I was 12th. So I finished 12th in like the build up to the main event. And then uh, it, was, it was actually back in 2011, the Red Bull Kart fight. Um, and that's it, then I won the actual event. So when all the top guys, I, I can't remember how many, maybe 30 drivers made it through to the big grand final in Cardiff. That's the one I won. So I won the, I won the important bit. So, um, yeah. <laughs> That, that was a really, really good weekend as well. Yeah, and all the Red Bull, all the Red Bull events are um, very good in terms of competitiveness. So that's a, a very, very good position overall. And the most recent achievement in Cardin was the Race of Champions in Buckmore back in July, I think it was. Yes. So I have a photo of this as well. Um, I watched the race, the entire race. That was an amazing dominance. So let me see. Here's the photo. Yeah, I, I planned, <laughs> you know, you over the years, you learn that you, you don't get many opportunities to get the good shot. So I knew there was a photographer there and I knew they were going to be selling the photos after the race. So I just made sure that you know, I had a, a few laps at the end where I was, you know, pretty comfortable at the front. So I had a bit of time to plan a good photograph over the line. And thankfully, the skilled photographers got some great shots. So, yeah, that, that was, was a good, good one. And what a great circuit in Buckmore. Uh, yeah, it's a great circuit. track. Yeah. And then, apart from that, uh, many people know you in the UK, at least, and many across Europe as, as, as well, as the BRKC founder, the British rental car uh, championship. So yes. where did you get that entrepreneurial spirit? Where do you have the ambition and motivation to create a championship that was going to have success, not only in the, in the UK, but also in Europe? And it's now considered uh, the best uh, rental car championship with the media, um, with all the broadcast coverage and everything. How do you get the idea? Yeah, so this was definitely not planned. Um, certainly not we never planned to have BRKC at the kind of scale it is today. Um, but basically, to again, trying to cut a long story short, my friend James Ald and I were sat around at a table at Bedford Autodrome and we both wanted to race some rental. We wanted a competitive rental car championship. We didn't really have enough money or um, time or we didn't really have the opportunity to go and do anything bigger at the time. So back in 2010, this is obviously before all the other cool stuff that we've spoken about happened. Yeah. Um, back in 2010, I was happy just to do some karting. And I'd been to the, the Indoor Kart World Championship, again on James Ald's recommendation. He knew about it. It was a thing that mainly happened in America back then. I'd seen how seriously some people took rental karting, particularly indoor karting. And I kind of thought, well, there isn't, there isn't anything I can find of similar nature in the UK. So together with... Uh, my fiance, well, girlfriend at the time, Rebecca, um, and my grandparents and my mum and some good friends, we kind of put together this, what was at the time quite a, a low level touring car championship that visited lots of different tracks. Nobody knew really what it was, but we managed to attract a few decent named drivers um, over the first year in 2010. We, we had Brendan Hartley, who has since raced in Formula One, um, among other drivers. I mean, it kind of evolved. It, it, this this monster evolved into something better and better and better each year, eventually ending up at Formula Fast indoor circuit as a permanent home, where hopefully you'll agree it's kind of stepped up a massive level because of the investment those guys are putting in, the effort, 
and the way we yeah. now are effectively just an official qualifier to the Indoor Kart World Championship or, or KWC. Um, and yeah, ev- everything is just a much, much higher level now. It's now, in my opinion, a very serious sporting event. We've gone from something fun for me to do to something which hopefully a, a lot of people enjoy and see as something worth winning, something very important. So um, I'm very proud of it. And um, just whilst we're talking about this, uh, I hope Formula Fast are surviving through this period because it's a really difficult time for for leisure businesses and particularly indoor car tracks at the moment with uh, with the virus situation because they're stuck with very big rent on a on a big property and obviously no income whatsoever so uh, i need to speak to the guys there and, and see what's going to happen for brkc 2021 so fingers crossed everything still goes ahead but we don't know at the moment but up until yes. now it's been really cool yeah so um, some greetings to the formula fast guys uh, they've done such a great job in the in the last years with uh, the brkc event and and many people agree that's a great um, event. So hopefully they can survive and so all the support for them and see what happens in the future. So BRKC is one of the reasons why I personally met you. And I still remember, and I will always, always remember some battles uh, we had, and not specifically in the BRKC, but in the BRKC Oblate 2018. And so I'll never forget that race that I was in pole position, actually, uh, surprisingly in pole position, and right ahead of you. And you kind of dive bomb the car in one of the corners that I didn't expect you would do. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, it was very clean. It was okay, very, fine. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, okay. that's, why, that's, that's why I'll never forget it, because it was like a must have perfect uh, month. And so that's when I realized, oh, wow, this, this guy is not, is not joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it was clean because um, there were some other drivers who I probably wasn't too clean with at that track that day. <laughs> uh, I consider the one a clean move, a clean and a very good move. But anyway, um, good stuff. Um, I'm very curious because of all this experience in karting. And you, you just said that before, PRKC is not only just another event to have fun, but also an event that many drivers go in with, um, with all their moderation to win or to or not, not just to win, but to win races or to perform very well. So it could be kind of a good training. So you that are a professional driver, that you are, you are driving real racing cars constantly. How do you think doing uh, or going karting improves your skills? What's the link between karting and real racing um, car driving? Yeah, so I think there's there's two things, two levels to this. And the first one is when you're, the most important thing about karting is it's something you can do when you're too young to race cars. So when you're in your formative years and your, you know, your, your mind is, is open and to learning and, and, you know, you're forming all your new skills at a very young age, karting is the thing you do. So it's yeah. it's very important for that reason because it forms the basis of your driving skill later in life and then when you're older like me now when you're quite a lot older i think it's still important to keep you sharp so i've not done any this year apart from brkc uh, actually i had one round in club 73 but i've not done very much this year because of the because of the coronavirus situation but ordinarily i'd be karting at least once every couple of weeks if not once a week because First of all, I enjoy it, but second, it's you don't want to get rusty. And if you're if you're out of a race car, um, then it's just a really really good way to. It's similar with sim racing, but maybe maybe even more so because there's a there's a fitness element too. It's yeah. good for just keeping your racing brain sharp and keeping your muscles active, and you know just keeping you in the zone. And although not every single element of driving a cart translates directly to driving a race car it's pretty close and it's certainly closer than most other activities you could be doing, you know, to keep fit, like going playing in tennis or whatever. So I think it's, um, it's important for those reasons. So, uh, even if you, even if you weren't very good at karting, but you were maybe, you know, say a very good car driver, I still think there would be a lot of benefit to going karting recreationally outside of the car racing weekends. Again, just to keep you sharp and just to, 
just to keep you thinking about where to gain time and you know no, that keeping that area in your brain active okay that's quite interesting um that's the answer i was wish i was looking forward to hear <laughs> so um, that's all from me uh, i think that's been a very great conversation um i don't know if you want to say anything about your, your next uh, events goals achievements in this year or <clears throat> next year in the future yeah so so really as we touched upon earlier this year i'm hoping to be out pretty soon with a team called um, british sports car services in a lotus elise race car um I'm really looking forward to it. First of all, it'd be nice to get back in something rear wheel drive um, and something that's pretty fast as well. Um, still in an endurance series, but this time I'm the only driver, so I'll be doing the whole race. So um, that'll be something different to the last few years. So it'll be quite nice to be the complete master of your own destiny. Um, and you know, you don't have anyone to answer to if something goes wrong, but equally, you know, you can take all the glory if it goes well. Um, I'm looking forward to racing at some UK tracks, which I haven't done in years. You know, I've, I've only done the one season back in 2007 of racing on UK tracks. So that'll be quite cool. So apart, I've got my simulator I'm sat in right now, uh, which will help me to learn those tracks again in preparation yeah. for um, for the season. And and yeah, I've got some really great sponsors who are helping me do that. So um, companies like NUA Motors, um, NUA Entertainment, 24 Security, um, as well as Avon Tires, who, are, who I actually work for. But they're also supplying the tyres for the car for the season, which which helps a lot because they do some really, really good race tyres. And um, yeah, yeah I, that, that's this year. And aside from that, just some sim racing, um, hopefully doing the Le Mans 24 hour um, official iRacing race in about a month's time. And lots of virtual reality stuff and hopefully some go-karting as well once things open back up again. So yeah, uh, aim for this year is to win that um, Super GT category in... Um, in that Lotus. All right, so keep us posted in your YouTube channel. Uh, we keep following all the races, both in the same racing and in real, <laughs> real life. Yeah, BTV, which is my, my YouTube series of blogs. BTV season three, which will be this season, um, will be hopefully a lot better than the previous ones. I've learned a lot about video editing. Um, we've got a nice computer over here to do some editing on and um, good cameras and stuff so yeah check out my youtube channel um which for some of you it's the one you're watching now if you're watching this a bit later it's um just search my name bradley philpott and you'll find it and yeah once the season starts we'll have some good video blogs okay thanks a lot for that bradley thank uh, you for having me and, and enjoy the rest of your night for you in the debate thank you <laughs> thanks See mario you. Uh, <laughs>